So we'll continue our discussion on the description of programming languages. And now we want to talk about uh, grammar and syntax in, in particular. So we want to discuss the syntax of uh, a programming language. And the question is, how do we describe it? Um, well, could we describe it use, uh, using a natural language? For example, let's think about uh, let's think about a particular construct in our programming language. Let's, for example, like a for statement. Um, for i for for int i is equal to zero, i less than let's say ten, i plus plus. And then we do some execute some statement or statements. Now this is a particular construct in a programming language like say Java or, or C. And this particular construct has a particular syntax associated with it. And we could try to describe it in a natural language, saying, well, first the programmer has to write the for keyword, then uh, he or she should write open paran, then what follows should be a, uh, a declaration of a variable like uh, int, uh, which is uh, actually a type of a variable, then the variable name itself uh, initialized with some value, and then we should have a semicolon, and that would conclude the initialization step, uh, then the boolean condition should follow that controls whether we should uh, execute the loop or not. Uh, and then uh, uh, the question is, okay, how does a boolean, boolean uh, condition look like? What is the syntax for a boolean condition? We would have to specify that as well. And then finally, we have an increment step at the end or an update step where uh, we can change the value of our index variable in the loop. And then there should be uh, some sequence of statements that should follow, which are the statements that we use to, in, in each uh, step of the loop, the statements that we want to execute. So in a way, we could try to um, describe the syntax of this particular construct so using a natural language, but it's not very precise. It depends on how exactly I, what words I selected, and so on. And uh, the other thing, uh, so yes, so, so this actually introduces ambiguity. We had actually talked about earlier that uh, natural language is, is ambiguous in nature. So I might have introduced some ambiguity when I tried to describe the syntax of the for statement. Uh, but what is even more important is that if I use a natural language for describing syntax, it is uh, really of no use in the translation process. You know, when we are translating a program in a high-level language into another, generally a low-level language. So that wouldn't help me there. Having a description in a natural language for a syntax of a programming language does not help us when we want to translate or compile a program for some language into another. Uh, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that we actually have some techniques that can describe uh, the syntactic uh, phenomena in a formal manner. And in this uh, regard, uh, Noam Chomsky comes into play. So if we just, well, let me actually just jump here um, to uh, his page in Wikipedia. So here it says uh, uh, Noam Chomsky, Agolam Noam Chomsky, uh, is an American linguist. He, he's uh, that has been his main field, linguist. Uh, but, he, but he's also a philosopher, cognitive scientist, logician, historian, political critic, and activist. 
So he has been uh, at MIT for a very long time, and he is a professor emeritus now at the Department of Linguistic and Philosophy at MIT, where he has worked for over 50 years. Uh, so how does he come into play with regard to programming languages? Well, Chomsky has been described as the father of modern linguistics. Uh, his work has influenced fields such as computer science, mathematics, and, and psychology. So his work in, linguist, in, in linguistics has actually influenced fields as, such as computer science. Uh, and the main, the main part that we are interested in here is the Chomsky hierarchy. So here it says, within the field of computer science, specifically in the area of formal languages, the Chomsky hierarchy is a hierarchy of classes of formal grammars. So in, uh, in uh, uh, the field of uh, formal grammars, which is a particular field in computer science, uh, the work of uh, Chomsky has been very influential. And we do not have time to go into any details in, into formal grammars, because that's really not part of, the, uh, of this course here. Um, but the important thing for us is that there is a particular type of formal grammars called type 2 grammars, or context-free grammars, that we are interested in context-free grammars. So, let's have a look here. So, context-free grammars. What is it? Uh, it is actually a, a fundamental device for the description of programming languages. So here, uh, context-free grammar is a formal way of describing uh, the syntax of programming languages as opposed to trying to, for example, trying to describe them using a natural language. So we need to introduce some terminology here before we go into the details. So if the set A is an alphabet, then A star is, is the set of all finite strings over A. And the star operator is called clean star. So. Uh, what do we mean by this? Well, for example, if we have a set A, if we have a set A, let's say A looks like this. A is a set here with two elements, A and B. Then the question is, what is A star? Well, according to the definition or the terminology, if the set A is an alphabet, in our case, it con contains the, the characters A and B, then A star is a set of all finite strings over A. So if I want to generate all the final strings, finite strings, I could generate A, um, a is part of the finite strings, B, I could generate a A, A B, I could generate B A, B B, I could generate A A B, and so on. There are a lot of possibil possibilities here. Uh, then the sequence of length zero also belongs to A star, and this is called the empty string, which is denoted by this special uh, symbol epsilon. So the empty string is also part of this set here, A star. The empty string is just a string of length zero. And a formal language over the alphabet A is nothing more than a subset of A star. So here, this is our terminology here. Now, now we can define uh, a context-free grammar. So, a context-free grammar is a quadruple. With a quadruple is a tuple which contains four components. 
and t in our case is the first component, t is the second, r is the third, and s is the fourth. So what do these uh, components mean? Well, nt is a finite set of symbols, either non-terminal symbols or, or uh, sometimes called variables or syntactic categories. So nt stands actually for non-terminal symbols. T is a, is a finite set of symbols, and they are often called terminal symbols. So there's a difference between uh, non-terminal symbols and terminal symbols. So uh, the, the terminal symbols are the ones that can, uh, cannot, cannot be further divided. So they are terminal in that sense. They are kind of like a leaves in a tree, where uh, a non-terminal symbol is a symbol that can be further uh, divided into something, or we can derive some other symbols from it. So they are non-terminals. And uh, uh, non-terminals are then uh, uh, like uh, uh, like uh, uh, like um, what is it called? Uh, nodes, uh, like uh, intermediate nodes in a tree. Not the not the leaves, not the terminal nodes. Uh, and then we have R, which is a final set of productions, so what, what is called also rules, each of which is composed of an expression of this form V R O W. So what is V? And this is a, so the rule looks like this V R O W uh, or V uh, we can also read that V can be transformed into uh, w, uh, where V, which is called the head of the production, is a single non-terminal symbol, and W is a string composed of zero or more terminals, or non-terminal symbols. Uh, we will take an example here uh, afterwards, which will explain this, because this is uh, very formal to, to begin with. And then uh, the fourth component, uh, identifies the starting element of the context free grammar. So S is an element of the non-terminal symbols, it's called the starting or the initial symbol. So let's take an example here. Uh, here we have a context free grammar and what is listed here are the rules. So this particular grammar is composed of the quadruple P, what was the first, pa uh, first part? It was the non-terminals. The non-terminals, uh, those are the, uh, the, terminal, the, the symbols that can be uh, transformed into something. So P is the, the non-terminal symbol. It's not a terminal symbol because uh, we can we can uh, transform P into something. Here it says that P, the first one says P can be empty or P can be A, P can be B, P can be A followed by P so and followed by A. So here we have a kind of a recursive definition and so on. So the first part is, is P, that's the non-terminal. Uh, then we have the terminal symbols. Those are, those are the ones that are in bold letters here. That those are A and B. Notice that there is no rule that says that we can transfer from A to something or B to something, and that's why they are called terminal symbols. Then R is the set of productions. Though this, this set is the, the, the five rules here that we just discussed. And P, which is the last component of the tuple, is the starting symbol. And this is an element of the non-terminal symbols, so in our case P is definitely the starting symbol. It's the one that is listed at the top here. And notice that a production or a rule can have an empty body, which we can see here as the first rule here. Uh, so that's really composed of the null symbol or the empty string. So we could have actually written here Epsilon. Here we can see the epsilon sign. So 
So P can be empty. That's what the first rule states here. So now let's look at a, a, uh, uh, a larger example. Here we have uh, a contest free grammar for arithmetic expressions. So we have uh, the grammar G. It contains the non-terminals E and I. And you can see from all these rules here that the non-terminals are the ones that can be transformed into something. So the non-terminals really appear here on the left side of the production rules. And then we have the terminal symbols A, B, plus, star, minus, open paran, closing paran. We can see those here, plus, star, minus, open parenthesis, closing parenthesis, A and B, and so, and so on. So those are the ones, remember, the, non -term the terminal symbols that cannot be further divided into anything. And then we have R, which is the set of productions, and those are numbered from 1 to 10. The productions are the rules of the grammar, and they are numbered from 1 to 10. And E is the starting symbol. That's the one that is listed first. So this grammar describes arithmetic expressions using uh, over the operators uh, plus, star, minus. So we have uh, the minus is actually both used as a unary operator notice here in rule number 5 and a binary operator as, as used in rule number 4. And the if we look at the first uh, rule, it says that E, E stands for an expression, can be uh, written as I. E goes to I, can we say. And what is I? Well, rule 7 says I goes to A, or I goes to B. But rule 9 says also that I can be I followed by A. So that means we can have more than one uh, letter of A, so it's a kind of a sequence of many letters of A's that can be generated from rule number 9, from basically rule number 7 and 9. And a sequence of many B's can be generated using rules 8 and uh, 10. So, uh, we can really say that a grammar defines a language. So, as grammar is... Uh, uh, inductively defines a language, a set of strings. So we're basically saying a language is a set of strings. Just think about, I mean, a natural language is really a set of strings. It's extremely large, it might even be infinite. And a programming language is really also a set of strings. It's the set of it's, it's all the strings that can be expressed in that particular programming language. Uh, so, we can use the contest-free grammar to generate these strings, these set of strings. And if we take an example here from our uh, grammar for arithmetic expressions, where we had the productions numbered from 1 to 10, we start with the starting symbol, which in our case is E, and we use the rule or production number 3 to transform or derive E star E from E. So we're deriving E star E from E. Why is that? because rule number three explicitly states that, that this can be done, that E can be transformed to E star E. So, in the next step, we transform the leftmost E to an I, and we're doing that using rule number one. If we go back, the rule number one says that E, that I, can be derived from E. In the third step, we transform an I to an IB using rule number 10. 
Rule number 10 says that IB can be derived from I. Then we transform the I to an A according to rule number 7. Rule number 7, yes, I goes to A. And uh, then we transform in the fifth step uh, the non-terminal E to the sequence parenthesis open, E, parenthesis close. And that's according to rule number 6, where it says that E goes to parenthesis open, E, parenthesis close. And this, we can continue this and uh, I encourage you to just go through this. Uh, we can continue these steps until we finally get to the point where we cannot further derive uh, you have not further use any production to further uh, divide the string. Uh, so at the, that means that at the very end we only have a sequence of terminal symbols. So a b star parenthesis open a plus B, parenthesis closed, is a sequence of uh, terminal symbols. And we can see that from our definition of this grammar that those are exactly the terminal symbols. A, B plus star minus, parenthesis open, parenthesis closed. So, and as we talked about earlier, we can transform a non-terminal symbol to something else, like when we transformed uh, in the fifth step an E to a parenthesis open, E parenthesis closed, but we cannot transform a terminal symbol to something else. So this is called the derivation. We basically have derived the string a, B star, parenthesis open, A plus B, parenthesis closed, from our grammar. So this particular string is just one example of the possible strings that can be derived from our grammar. So here we have a formal uh, definition of derivation. So it says that if we have a grammar, which is a four-tuple, and uh, we have assigned two strings, V and W, over the union of the non-terminals and the terminals. We say that W is immediately derived from V uh, if W is obtained from V by replacing one of the non-terminals in V with one of that non-terminalist productions. So, uh, what does this really mean? If W is obtained from V by replacing one of the non-terminals in V with one of that non-terminalist production. Let's go back to uh, this uh, derivation. Um, so we are basically saying that we were able, if we look at, at the steps one and two here, going from, from E star E to I star E. So we said we were able to go from E star E to I star E. So this string E star E is our uh, W, whereas I star E is our, sorry, E star E is V and I star E is W in, in our definition here. So we were able to obtain V from, sorry, obtain W from V by replacing one of the non terminals in V with one of that non-terminalist production. So, what did we do? We 
we were able to transform E star E to I star E because we used the following production. One of the productions in the grammar is E goes to I. And that's the one that we used to transform this E, the one that is on the left hand side, to an I. And that's how we were able to transform the string E star E to I star E. That's really what the this formal definition says or specifies. And we also the the definition also says that uh, we say that W is derived from V and we write V uh, arrow star W if there exists a finite sequence of immediate derivations. So instead of writing all the derivations out that V uh, can uh, that W0 can be derived from V and W1 can be derived from W0, and so on. We, then we can write this as a single step using this particular operator R rho star. So for example, E star E can in many steps, in more than in, in uh, zero, basically in zero or more steps, um, uh, been, be transformed to the string a b star uh, a plus b inside parenthesis. So instead of writing everything out in, in many, many steps uh, showing all the individual rules, we can say that this particular uh, string e star e can, which is, is the first one here at the top, can be derived in many steps to the terminal symbol a b star a plus b. So we said that uh, we can use the grammar of the language to generate all the possible strings. So a generated language is really just a language that is generated by the grammar. So it's all the strings that are member of T star. T, remember, is the set of terminal symbols. T star means all the possible uh, uh, strings of uh, length zero or more from the uh, set of terminal symbols. Uh, but W has uh, the uh, is uh, is constructed in such a way that it is derived from the starting symbol in zero or more steps. 